All right, hello and welcome to our webinar on instrumenting your applications with Stats D and Sensu Go. I'm developer advocate Todd Campbell. I'll be joined today by principal developer advocate Jeff Spoletta and our CEO Caleb Haley. So let's get started. Today we're going to discuss what is Sensu Go, what is Stats D, how you get started with Stats D, including a few demos, and putting all that together into an actual web application and another demo. And then we're going to discuss APM and what this means for APM. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Caleb to discuss what is Sensu Go. Thanks, Todd. So what is Sensu Go? Sensu is the turnkey observability pipeline that delivers monitoring as code on any cloud. Sensu provides a flexible automation platform for DevOps and SRE teams, allowing them to reuse their existing monitoring and observability tools uh, and integrate with best of breed data platforms. With Sensu, you get complete visibility from bare metal to Kubernetes. Some popular Sensu use cases include eliminating data silos by integrating with existing systems of record and those popular or best of breed data platforms like Elasticsearch and Splunk, uh, consolidating monitoring tools with support for your existing plugins and exporters, and automated diagnosis and self-healing with built-in auto remediation in the Sensu platform or integrations with basically every automation platform. With Sensu, you can monitor any app or service using your existing tools on any cloud. Here's a high-level overview of the Sensu observability pipeline, which provides an integration layer between the data we're collecting, uh, policy-based routing, scheduling, and um, uh, multi-tenancy provided by the Sensu observability control plane, and again, those integrations uh, with those best-of-breed uh, observability tools. And we deliver all of this as code. So here on the left, you can see your infrastructure code, a modern infrastructure as code uh, in the form of Kubernetes deployment YAML and side by side with Sensu's monitoring as code. But Sensu's monitoring as code isn't just limited to the installation and configuration of agents or collectors uh, collecting the observability data. With Sensu, you get a complete end-to-end -end, uh, pipeline for end-to-end -end solution for monitoring as code. That starts with uh, instrumentation, the automated uh, distribution and installation of those plugins and exporters, a scheduler, scheduling and orchestration, diagnosis, the automated detection, deduplication and correlation of events, alerts and incident management, uh, storage and analysis using the data platform of your choosing, and automated remediation. That's not just forwarding events uh, for an external system to evaluate and decide how to take action, but actually codifying those remediation actions alongside uh, your, your monitoring configurations, uh, again, as code. And all of this is designed for direct integration with your CI-CD pipeline. So we give you the ability to sort of uh, start from scratch, maybe start with a few simple examples, and export your running configuration to commit into your config uh, or code repository and then directly integrate with the CI CD pipeline. So now what is stats D? Stats D is a network daemon that listens for stats. Stats D with stats D, you can collect statistics using TCP or UDP. So you have your sort of choice of uh, delivery guarantees there. And StatsD uh, as, a, as a solution will then flush those collected stats to any number of compatible backends, like a time series database. And StatsD is also a data format. So you have a very simple line protocol, a very easy interface for uh, representing um, telemetry data uh, as plain text. Sassy was originally developed uh, out of Etsy. Uh, that project started back in 2011. That was inspired by earlier work from the Flickr team in 2008. And the original uh, open source uh, StatsD daemon was written in Node.js. StatsD as a, like most modern uh, telemetry um, uh, frameworks provide support for a variety of different metric types, including uh, counters, timers, gauges, and sets. And today, StatsD has really become more about the, the, this reference implementation and more or less an open standard protocol. So uh, we have that um, line protocol for StatsD and this sort of reference architecture that is uh, uh, installing a client in your code, in your applications and services, emitting those metrics to some sort of server or daemon to consume them and storing them in some sort of backend. This is supported by tons and tons of products and tools today, including Stensu, 
but also one of the more popular uh, examples has been even Datadog it, with Datadog's custom metric solution that is backed primarily by uh, Dog Stats D. So why Sensu plus Stats D? Well, first of all, Sensu has always provided support for what we think of as popular and standards-based uh, monitoring and observability uh, frameworks and uh, protocols. So uh, historically, Nagios was one of those popular um, popular interfaces. So Sensu has always supported the Nagios check specification. That's why you can take an old Nagios check script and it just works in Sensu in a very modern context, uh, as well as uh, StatsD. We have some native support for StatsD. It used to be you could install uh, in the Sensu agent via an extension. Now it's built in in Sensu Go, as well as uh, built-in support in the Sensu uh, event format, uh, native support for metrics. And the other thing that works really nicely, or why, <clears throat> excuse me, why Sensu and StatsD work very nicely together is they share sort of similar architectures. So with StatsD, you have that client server backend architecture. With Sensu, you have an agent pipeline backend uh, architecture. So the Sensu agent and pipeline together sort of serve as that server and giving you a much richer uh, sort of workflow and um, uh, automation capabilities in that uh, observability pipeline. Um, to do perhaps dual delivery or um, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of multi-tenant uh, delivery pipeline for metrics that you may be collecting via StatsD and the Sensu platform. That's all from me, back to you, Todd. Right, so how do you get started with StatsD? Well, you can start with the example that Caleb showed earlier where we're using the StatsD line protocol and simply using Netcat to send it to a StatsD server. So in this case, we're sending the metric foo with a value of one as a counter to our StatsD server, but that's not scalable by any means. So you could start by using your programming language of choice standard libraries to create a connection to your StatsD server and, and do the same thing where you're sending just the, the StatsD line protocol in plain text to, to the server, or you can integrate your applications with existing client libraries that can be found here on this website. Yeah, the cool thing about StatsD is there's so many different client libraries already available, but you can really roll your own in quite a reliable fashion using the um, TCP like uh, standard library, uh, client libraries for TCP and UDP and basically string interpolation, right? You're just <laughs> emitting some text to a TCP socket or UDP socket. So very easy to sort of build just enough of a StatsD implementation that you can use across your applications and services. So some more other StatsD resources you can find. Uh, Datadog actually provides quite a large collection of information on StatsD uh, from, their, from their blog and, and also uh, code examples. Yep, over the years, this, this blog post on the StatsD blog has been sort of one of our favorites to refer customers to. to it, it probably does an even better job of telling the StatsD history than I did just a moment ago. Um, but also gives sort of a very nice high level overview of the value proposition of StatsD, how simple and lightweight it is. And then of course their documentation provides some great examples for getting started. Exactly. So let's get into our demos now. Uh, we're going to take actually some of the code from the stats from the dog StatsD web pages, and we're going to actually just use those code and compile them and send them to uh, our Sensu agent StatsD listener and, and take it from there. Uh, in these demos, we're going to use the counter data types, the gauge data type, as well as the histogram data type. So let's get let's get started with our first demo. I'd like to demonstrate how you can use your existing StatsD code without modification to be collected by the Sensu Agent StatsD listener. To do this, I will be copying and pasting code directly from the Datadog Dog StatsD page and running that code on a server with the Sensu Agent listening on the StatsD port. That data will then be collected into InfluxDB for graphing in Grafana. First, here is my agent machine, and we can show that it is indeed the Sensu agent that is listening on the StatsD port. And if we look at my Sensu agent's configuration, we can see that the StatsD events will be sent to the InfluxDB handler on the back end. And we can also see here my currently empty Grafana dashboard, because in fact, in my current InfluxDB, There are no measurements. So let's get started with copying the code into my demo here. 
So if we go back over here to the dog stats D page, first code example is for a counter and it'll be include an increment operation, a decrement operation and a static counter. So let's just take this code, let's copy and paste it into the right window. It builds, let's kick it off and we get it running. And if we go back to my Grafana page, we should momentarily start to see, yep, here we go. We have uh, data coming into Grafana via InfluxDB, which we can see the increment operation, the decrement, and the counter being static at two. If we give this a little more time, yeah, we can see the, the graph starting to, to move along. The, uh, the counters are increasing. And if we actually go back now and look at our measurements, we'll see that now we're getting the example metrics measurements that were being sent from Datadog. We'll give this just another couple of runs here so we can continue to see the data being brought in. And we'll move on to the next example. Okay. So our next example is now going to be a gauge. And we'll just copy and paste this existing code. And we'll kill that demo. Paste in this new code, build it, run it, go back to Grafana, and we should start to see data being populated into this graph and this gauge. So we can see it gets started here and it should ramp up again after another couple of uh, intervals. You can also see that my Increment and decrement counts are, are flattening out now because that data is not being sent anymore from that from the first example that I stopped to start this example. And now we can see our, our gauge continues to, to go up. So let's move on to the third example, which is actually a set, which is actually is sent as a gauge data type into stats D. So let's take this code and let's copy and paste it. Let's kill the currently running one. Oops, let's get blocked. Let's build it. Oops. You mean code I copy and pasted didn't compile? Oh, this isn't Stack Overflow. We might have to fix this. So let's go fix this code. Get rid of this. And this is actually a float, so we can't do an integer operation on it. We'll replace this with this, and this needs to be a time duration type. Now it works. So let's kick it off. And again, let's go back to our Grafana page. And now we're seeing our gauge as a set example start to populate. Give it another interval or so to see it happen. And there it is. And let's do one more example here real quick of a histogram. And so we'll copy this, copy this code. Let's go back to my agent. Place that code, paste in the new code. And let's hope this one compiles. It does. Let's kick it off. Go back to Grafana. And we should start to see this histogram being populated. Another interval or two to show up. I believe this is using some random numbers. Yeah, so we should see this kind of move all over the place as expected. I'm actually mapping the mean and the max from, from this data set. 
And let's just really quick for the last bit, let's just take a look at how we're actually doing this. We're, we're selecting using our data source in FlexDB. We're doing a select on our example metrics table, which is what's in the Datadog code, uh, using a tag of environment equals dev. We're looking at the uh, histogram mean for the mean uh, point and the max for the max point. And that's the end of my demo showing how you can take your existing, at least Golang stats decode and send it into your sensu agent stats D listener and have it uh, be graphed to a influx db in grafana all right so now that we've done that uh, sample in golang uh, caleb's actually going to show you the same type of work in ruby thanks todd i'm going to pick up where you left off from the dog stats d uh, documentation that we find here, but instead of using the Go examples, I'm going to use the Ruby CodeLang examples, and um, instead of showing all of the StatsD data types, I'm just going to pick uh, the last example you showed, which is the um, histogram example. And my environment uh, is a little bit different than yours. I'm using the Sensu Go workshop. This is available in the Sensu GitHub org. It's an easy way to sort of uh, spin up an entire reference architecture around Sensu that includes uh, Sensu Go, the backend agent, uh, a time series database, Grafana, and so on. And I'm using the default Sensu Go workshop environment that gives me um, TimescaleDB DB as my time series database and Grafana. And my um, StatsD port, I'm forwarding the localhost port 32790. So we'll keep that in mind as we go forward here. Uh, so here's my running Sensu environment just with a single agent configured for now and my example dashboard. So let us, um, I think I actually have already the file here. So let us uh, start fresh and um, edit this file. I will paste in this example very much like um, in your case, Todd, I found that there is a small bug in this example. And so we will fix that little typo there. And I'm using port, uh, I'm forwarding port 32790 to us, an agent again running um, on Docker on my machine. And so I will modify the default port there but I would otherwise expect that this should just work. Uh, and I will need to install the um, StatsD uh, Ruby gem. So I'll do that like this. Uh, I think it is dog StatsD Ruby. So now I have um, installed the Ruby gem. And if I did everything correctly, I will run this. This will emit metrics to that uh, local port. And similar to the example, you see I'm starting to uh, get metrics uh, in my database and graph them here using uh, Grafana. And sort of following the example, same thing like you would expect um, in Datadog that you're getting uh, a, a graph that's sort of showing you the min, max, average, and so on. I can do the same thing here in, um, in Grafana with the time series database of my choosing. And this was StatsD with Ruby and Sensu Go. Right. So those were those demos. Let's uh, let's move on now. Let's let's put this all together. And uh, Jeff's going to show us an example web app and instrumenting it. So take it away, Jeff. Thanks, Todd. Yeah. So those were some great demos on on the basics of how to make use of that uh, Datadog implementation of SatsD. And I'm actually going to go further, and I'm going to use um, some of those elements in an actual uh, web application I've been running. So, so what I'm gonna show you here is uh, showing how to use uh, examples of, of counters, gauges, and histograms to collect user activity metrics that you might be interested in in terms of your web application. But more importantly, I'm going to show you how to use the stats, these timers, so you can get uh, performance metrics out of your web application uh, functions. Uh, and, and more importantly, all of this sort of adds up to being uh, an example. Uh, StatsD is really good at being a flexible framework so that you can get custom metrics out of your web applications for exactly what you need in terms of instrumentation. So what I'm going to show you next is, uh, is a demonstration uh, using 
uh, a Python Flask application that I've been writing. Uh, I call it Eel Slime, and it is a web application to implement the snake oil card game so that I can play it with my friends in a socially distant fashion. Uh, I'll be really focusing on using these function timers uh, as an APM light sort of uh, concept where I'm going to get uh, performance information from the functions that I've written in my web application uh, so that I can see as I'm prototyping uh, ways to do it, uh, which ones are, are actually performant for my uh, use case. I'm also going to show you an example of a StatSeeds gauge in use uh, just to collect some information about what the user activity is in the web application. In the previous demos, you saw examples of the DogSat D histogram metrics data type. This is actually an abstraction of the standard StatsD timer metrics data type. The original implementation for StatsD was built to provide metrics for web applications, and timing of function execution was an important part of that original mission. Many StatsD client implementations provide function decorators for timers as they are so commonly used when doing function performance testing. I'm going to show you how easy it is to make use of StatsD timers to measure web application function performance using a little web application I've been developing in Python Flask. Let me introduce you to EelSlime, a web application to help me play the snake oil card game while socially distancing with my friends. It's a pretty simple Flask app so far, with only one important web page view to manage the card hands, allowing you to draw and discard cards from your hand on each round. The core functionality of this web application is to help draw cards from the pool of available nouns for each round of the game. For convenience, while developing the app, I've been using an online random word generator to provide the nouns, but I also use a static backup word list in case the random word service falls over. Here's a look at the function that pulls the cards. Here I've instrumented the card, draw card drawing function using a simple DogSat D timer so I can see how well the function is performing. I've also added a simple counter to help me keep up with the error rate when trying to grab new random nouns from the online service. This should look very familiar to the previous histogram and counter demos. You import the Datadog module, initialize with the stats D host information, but this time all I need to do was to use the Python function decorator instead of manually adding the the histogram stat. This decorator does all the work behind the scenes to time the function and then send that information on as if it were a histogram. Now if I run this Python function to load test it, we can see how well it performs by looking at Microfauna dashboard. I'm now just running this function in a loop with a small sleep in between. I'm sending this through my Sensu agent that's running as a SATSD server. And then that in turn is actually calling an influx DB handler and then populating the Grafana view. So here is my Grafana dashboard. So every 10 seconds or so, the Sensu agent is, em is emitting the SATSD event with the metrics. And I have my dashboard um, set up similarly. So I have information here from both metrics showing up. So in the top graph, I have information about the error count and, and just the number of counts associated with how many times that function is being called. So in this case, it looks like every single time I'm running it, the online service is erroring out. I'm also getting information from the timing from, um, about the minimum amount of time associated with that 10 seconds worth of data, um, each packet, the mean, the max time, and the 90th percentile. So in this case, the online service is sort of falling over for, for me, and I'm using, I'm using that static information for the words every single time, and then randomly sorting them. So that's actually reasonably fast. I probably don't need to use the online system. But I can go further than this. Instead of just just uh, telemetrizing this one function, I can actually telemetrize the Flask route. So let me stop this 
and show you the routes. So here is the route page for the Flask app. It's not much there right now, but basically the cards route does just a little bit of work, but it calls the new cards function when the form submit button has been pushed. So what I want to do here is provide some information um, in my dashboard as to how many times that submit's been pushed. I also want to provide timing information about the whole route, including the rendering of the template and any of the extra work beyond that random card draw function. So I can do that pretty simply. First, I have to initialize the DocSats D information. Then I just have to add the decorator. Associated with the metric I want and I'm going to just use a different metric name so it doesn't get confused with the metrics coming in from the other function. And now I want to provide a submetric associated with this function that's just a gauge. So here I have a gauge that's a submetric to flashcards called submit. And if I've done this right, I should be able to restart my Flask application and not get any errors. Go back to the home page, go to the cards page. I'm hitting the submit button, which is the draw cards. And every time I do that, the submit count goes up, which is good. And now I'm just going to discard all the cards every single time. And let's see. So, so far, the Grafana dashboard doesn't have any information about these new values. I'm going to actually turn on one of the queries I already have set up here. Instead of looking up new cards, what I want to do is I want to look up the metric flash cards and then I'm going to get the submit value which is the basically the value of that gauge. And now we see it's there so let me save this. So the orange line now is the submit count button. And as we continue to submit, the gauge should go up associated with that. So I still have all the information about the, about the actual new card draw still, but now I actually have information about how many times this route has been submitted. So um, I can also add timing information. I already went ahead and did it. The, the dash purple line here is the max time associated with the route and it's actually just a little bit more time than the max time associated with the draw. So right now the, the drawing function is most of the time and so in this way you start cutting up where your time performance bottlenecks are in your web application. So in a, in a way this is effectively sort of uh, application performance light. Um, you're monitoring just the functions that you care about in terms of critical path and, and getting the information you need with the timers. All right, thanks, Jeff, for that excellent demo. That was that was very nice. One thing you did mention, you mentioned uh, Stasd is APM light. So, that question is this: is this really APM? Uh, good question, Todd. So, um, the short answer is Stasd APM. The short answer is no. Um, so what is APM? APM is application performance monitoring. It's a very well-established uh, practice and sort of business requirement. And within APM, you have different types of, um, of telemetry data. You have application metrics that can be sort of the function-based or, or um, service-based, like uh, things that are being accomplished 
maybe even business metrics, uh, code level metrics, that's just like runtime profiling and other profiling within the application. Some definitions will try to tell you that uh, there is such a thing as a network-based APM. We sort of believe that's a, in its own separate category. So we've struck that from our list here. And now more recently, uh, tracing has become quite popular. It's been around for some time, but uh, definitely gaining in popularity as our systems become more and more distributed. Uh, it, it, the challenge of piecing together how an overall system uh, is behaving or performing does start to require um, something like uh, distributed tracing. And that's sort of where we see APM headed. Uh, for a while, our, our worldview has been that distributed tracing is really next generation APM or the final frontier for APM. Uh, definitely needed uh, in, in a distributed system. Also helpful in, in almost any system. Um, and so distributed tracing, you're starting to see a lot of the, the popular uh, APM providers beginning to offer this or sort of reposition their, um, their flagship products, uh, APM products um, as a distributed tracing solutions. One exciting thing about all of this uh, momentum is that there's also some momentum around an open standard. So we love to see this uh, two previous um, uh, open source uh, tracing projects uh, sort of merged together, joined forces and um, that, that we're, there's, there's a lot of industry momentum around that. A number of uh, monitoring and observability products are beginning to offer uh, built-in support for open telemetry. This just gives all of us a lot more choice. Um, we have some open telemetry integration on our roadmap, even for Sensus. So uh, really uh, happy to see that uh, sort of coming into view in the APM world. So what are the benefits of APM? Uh, historically, the benefits have been that you have this sort of instrument my application and and it just works experience where you um, you drop in a code library and suddenly you have a dashboard full of metrics um, and it really does work like that and um, another great thing about APM is over the years there have been there has been just an absolute flood of options in terms of uh, how you can approach APM different strategies different technologies in use um, and pros and cons of a variety of different tools there, but there's just a lot of choice all the way from the open source end of the spectrum to fully uh, SaaS based uh, vendor solutions. And they all sort of give you this get started in minutes, you know, instrument the library, look at a dashboard, sort of quick start experience where you can then sort of learn over time and get the mastery, not just of those tools, but of your actual application uh, product and services. Um, so you, you sort of gain a better operational understanding of your systems, very much thanks to the, the value that's provided by these APM tools. However, that, that sort of then leads you into some of the challenges related to APM, which is if you have a, an APM only uh, solution for, um, for monitoring or observability, you're gonna be missing context. There's, there's a lot that APM can do in terms of saying, hey, the function that talks to the database is taking a lot longer to uh, complete than it normally does. That doesn't actually tell us what's wrong with the database. Yeah, I should, I'd like to jump in here. Uh, in my previous uh, work where I actually worked for uh, a development company or a software company where we actually had an iOS application that was doing a lot of data from the users. It was an IOT application. Uh, and the back end, you know, we, we instrumented the back end with, with an APM solution. And what we really found was that it was always telling us symptoms and not really the underlying problem. Uh, and, you know, because uh, we end up, the underlying problem didn't end up being associated with infrastructure resourcing or, or some network resourcing uh, bottlenecks. And the APM by itself couldn't tell us what the solution was. It could just tell us that things were falling over and our yep. users are being impacted. So, so it was always a piece of the puzzle, but not, not uh, everything you needed to know what was going wrong. Yep, and the reverse is also true. That's why you see a lot of the APM uh, vendors offering infrastructure monitoring, you know, so they, they complement the APM and the infrastructure monitoring vendors are trying to offer some application monitoring. So uh, you, you, you can't have one really without the other and they're quite complementary. But um, just as a, as a challenge related to a, a pure APM approach, it, it, it's not a one, it's not a, like a, a single solution to all the observability problems. Um, another challenge with APM is that 
that very cool experience of instrumenting your application and going and immediately being presented with dozens or hundreds of metrics, it feels cool. You're getting a lot of value for very little effort, but over time, how you, you in many cases, talking to our customers over the years, they find themselves over time having really sort of under, gotten a lot of value from the APM, but part of that value is in better understanding that the key metrics that really tell them how their systems are, are behaving or performing or where there may be uh, opportunities to improve those systems are a much smaller number of uh, metrics that they really need to pay closer attention to. So and sometimes you can have a signal noise uh, problem there. Um, and, 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 and over time sort of identify where there may be an opportunity to, um, to, to sort of just focus on those key metrics. That dovetails into one of the other problems that, with APM that is uh, over time as your system sort of grows and, and scales, increases in complexity, but also sort of the footprint of the system begins to, um, to scale quite a bit. The costs, the APM can be sort of cost prohibitive. And um, what ends up happening is organizations will very often adopt some sort of sampling technique that is let's disable APM on some percentage of, of these application or service instances. And that reduces their overall visibility. We've heard stories along the lines of, oh, you know, when we will hear a user reported uh, challenges or behaviors or issues, and then need to sort of re-enable APM across all <laughs> instances of an application or service in order to capture um, some data they may have been missing. So, so this sort of uh, back and forth challenge over time as your APM journey is sort of maturing can, um, can be a challenge, which brings us back to the question that we asked at the top of this section that, that Jeff sort of posed, which is, is this APM the really unfortunate answer is it depends. You know, maybe your mileage may vary. Um, our our worldview is that Statsy is not an APM solution, but it is great for collecting application performance data or even business metrics out of your applications. Um, it can be used to supplement APM. So if your APM provider or existing tooling is not giving you all the metrics you need, you could easily instrument your application using Statsy and uh, and sort of fill in some gaps. And some very specific use cases in our in our experience, this is typically with uh, organizations that have uh, a lot of experience around APM. They've tried a bunch of tools, uh, and they've they've been doing APM for a, a long time. You may find in those very specific cases, tools like StatsD or even a Prometheus can provide just enough APM, uh, collect those key metrics, send them to your data platform, sort of best of breed. Uh, a data platform you may already have in place, an Elasticsearch, uh, Splunk, an InfluxDB, TimescaleDB, whatever the data platform is, uh, and that can pro provide just enough APM. So that's our uh, webinar for today. We want to leave with a few comments on how to get started with Sensu Go and StatsD. Uh, first of all, Sensu, uh, it's free to download um, and free to completely free to use up to your first 100 nodes. Uh, this includes all of the commercial features of the Sensugo platform. Uh, and then as you sort of approach or reach that 100 node limit, you can then begin a 30 day trial that will give you an unlimited use license. So you can really evaluate Sensu at scale, whether that's a few hundred or a few thousand uh, nodes or systems uh, uh, that you need to bring under management. And at the end of that trial, then our pricing starts at $3 per node per month for unlimited metrics. If you have any questions about pricing, please contact our sales team by visiting the Sensu uh, website and uh, clicking on the uh, pricing uh, uh, option at the top. Um, next steps for getting, once you are, uh, have downloaded and installed Sensu and wanna try our StatsD integration, uh, we have some great documentation in the Sensu docs for getting started with StatsD. Or as we showed today, you can, probably go find a StatsD getting started guide uh, from, from anywhere on the web and it should just work with Sensu. Um, that Sensu agent being your uh, acting as your StatsD daemon and then our documentation sort of explains how to uh, configure the routing of uh, sort of a massaging uh, and processing and routing of those metrics to for, um, for storage and analysis in the back end of your choosing. If you have any questions uh, or, or want to share your experiences or feedback as you're playing with uh, getting started with Sensu Go and StatsD, please join the Sensu Community Discourse. Uh, it's free to sign up, uh, lots of uh, helpful 
folks there from the Sensu community, as well as the three of us, members of our developer advocacy team, and even uh, our, the Sensu engineering team. Or if you are interested in a one-on-one -on -one demo, how this may be applicable to your business, don't hesitate to uh, contact us for a, a private one-on-one uh, -on -one demo. Looking ahead at some upcoming events, we are very excited for a January webinar, uh, joint webinar with Rundeck. Uh, we will be showing there the automated remediation uh, integration uh, with Sensu and Rundeck. It's actually a two-way integration. Uh, Rundeck has added a Sensu integration to go with the Sensu Rundeck integration, and we'll walk through how to um, how to achieve that sort of automated remediation workflow using uh, Sensu and Rundeck. Um, you're going to hear a lot from us about monitoring as code in the coming weeks, including a new blog post and a webinar to follow about uh, monitoring as code with Sensu Go and Sensu Flow. Sensu Flow being a new sort of prescriptive um, workflow for integrating Sensu with your CI CD pipeline to go from that quick sort of getting started all the way through to an actual monitoring as code implementation. And then the next major feature in the Sensu product roadmap is one we call business service monitoring, which adds contextual intelligence to the Sensu observability pipeline. Um, and that's sort of like a aggregation or um, aggregates of aggregates uh, in Sensu, a multi-tiered aggregation solution for Sensu and really allows you to um, define service components services and their related service components, even shared service components across services. So you can model inside of Sensu service health in the way that your, your business and your customers think about it. Uh, so that's all we have for today. Thanks for joining. Uh, we hope that this was helpful and we'll catch you on the next one.